Um, good morning. Um, first of all, I would say that I'd like to say that it's a great honor to receive this prestigious prize. And um, I will give sort of a bit of a historical perspective on how this structure had happened. So by the 1970s, it had been established that DNA is the genetic material of all living uh, things, how it's replicated and how genes are transcribed into messenger RNA and how protein synthesis work. So then the question turned to how the very long, meter-long DNA inside each one of our cells is packaged into this tiny space of a cell or the nucleus, which is about a million times smaller than a, rain, a grain of rice. Um, this question led to the discovery or characterization by Roger Gomberg, Gene Thomas, and others of the existence of a building block of the, nucle uh, of the chromosome called uh, the nucleosome. And in this structure, an octameric complex of proteins, the histones, organizes about 150 base pairs of DNA. It then obviously became obvious that if, if we wanted to understand how this structure functions and is built, then we needed to determine the three-dimensional structure of this building block, the nucleosome. Uh, at the structural method available 50 years ago, half a century ago, was X-ray crystallography, which had already been used to determine the, the structure of many proteins uh, starting in the late 50s, um, and also nucleic acid. So for this, for being able to do crystallography, you need, you need to have crystals. So the structure of the nucleosome core particle took, took, the atomic structure took 25 years, 21 years to achieve, and obviously many researchers involved in this. Um, the story starts, started in 1976 when I obtained the first crystals of the nucleosome core. And um, we had a very low resolution structure in 1977, and then between 77 and 1981, Tim Richmond joined the lab. And by 1981, uh, we had a seven angstrom structure which gave um, the overall architecture from which we could use the overall ar architecture of the nucleosome. Um, thank you. Um, I will uh, talk a bit about the history of how we got to here. And then Tim uh, and Caroline will, um, I believe, this describe the details of how we got from a low resolution structure to the atomic structure of the nucleosome. So um, I arrived in England. I'm Italian and grew up in Sweden. I arrived in England in Cambridge in 1969. And this is by now very famous Medical Research Council Laboratory Molecular Biology in Cambridge, which by now has obtained 13 Nobel Prizes, a quite a small institute. And this institute created by the Medical Research Council, the purpose was to do basic curiosity-driven research. And the person who gave me a job originally as a technician to work on the structure of tRNA was Aaron Klug, who himself is a Nobel Prize winner, 1982 Nobel Prize winner. Uh, so the question we had was, how does DNA compact inside the nucleus? So here you have a chromosome spread inside the nuclear space, and here depicted is actually the X chromosomes. And even in the X chromosome, which is quite small, you have about 150 million base pairs of DNA, which is in length would be 50 millimeters. So the question is, how does DNA, but two meters of DNA pack into chromosome and chromatin? Um, so the nucleosome, 
was discovered in mid 70s, as I said by Roger Comberg and Jean Thomas and other, using biochemical approaches like chromosomal DNA is packaged by repeating unit, the nucleosome. And um, a key result was the finding that if you take chromatin and you chop it up with a nuclease, which is in this case is micrococcal nuclease, you get a, a ladder of bands that repeat, the repeat is 200 base pair, the smallest unit being 200 base pair, 400, 600. So this is the DNA. By electron microscopy, uh, you originally, by the olins and olins, you see this bead on a string effect. So this, uh, the thin line is DNA. This is shadowing, rotary shadowing. The blobs are the nucleosome. And um, as I said, the building block of chromosome is the nucleosome, this blob here, in which an octopermeric complex of protein organizes about 200 base pair of DNA, or actually 150, and there is a fifth histone, H1, which protects a bit more of the DNA. And the fact that it was octameric complex was through the beautiful work of Jean Thomas, who did cross-linking experiments. So why structural biology? And I think structural biology, seeing is believing. Structural biology is a field fo uh, focused on understanding biological macromolecules such as protein and nucleic acid, deciphering the effect of changes to the structure of these biological macromolecules is essential for elucidating the function and the part they play in disease. Um, so, as I've already said, so the next question after the discovery of this building block is what is the structure? Uh, to under, as I said, that to understand function, one needs to have knowledge of the 3D structure. And the method of choice in the 1970s was extra crystallography. And for this, you need crystals. And these are actually crystals of the nucleosome core. They're very, very beautiful because they are so, the content is 50% DNA, so that makes them incredibly birefringent. And uh, how did we do it? So I remind you, in the 70s, uh, when we started this work, there were no restriction enzymes. We didn't know how to express proteins. So the only source of material was uh, from animals or, or you know, native material. So we made nucleosome core from beef, kidney, rat, liver, and chicken blood, sea urchin, sperm, and so on. Uh, fortunately, there is a lot of chromatin in, in, in cells, so you can make and also what I should say, if you do crystallography, you require milligram quantities of this material. And the person who really figured out how to make as homogeneous preps or nucleosome cores as possible was Sven Latter. Uh, this is done by taking the, the I'll yeah, show you the micrococcal ladder, is to digest very tightly or to limit digest so you free nucleosome cores from the chromatin. And as I will show you later, crystallization itself was driven by divalent ion. Uh, this was pretty obvious when if you worked making chromatin from nuclei is that in order to retain the compaction of DNA, you, you need divalent ion. And if you remove them, the, nucleus, the nuclei will explode. So uh, and also. What I had learned from working on the crystal structure of the RNA is if you want to crystallize a nucleic acid, you need to neutralize the charge on the DNA or the molecules will repel each other. And then uh, fa fairly early on, remember that this material comes from uh, natural sources. What we release are nucleosome core containing mixed sequence DNA, and therefore, Already early on, we had to think of a way of making at least the DNA homogeneous as possible. And we reconstituted uh, the first nucleosome core with homopolymer DNA, which we could buy. I said, I remind you, it was pre-restriction enzymes. And this shows actually limit digest or reconstituted nucleosome core, where you start digesting this is roughly the 200. You have a stop at 160 about, and then you, you digest the material so you get the tight uh, DNA band. And um, 
so, uh, so you, you get the crystal, and this shows actually electron microscopy image uh, of when you set up crystallization of nucleosome, after a couple of hours, you see the nucleosome lining up in this columnar structure, which is quite interesting because at the end of my talk, I will show you telomeric chromatin structure. And this picture is taken by John Finch, who was a wonderful electron microscopy. And actually, even in negative stain, you can see the two gyres of DNA by eye on the nucleosome. And this is the packing in the crystal, and you can see it's end-on hexagonal packing. And then you, you shoot X-rays through this crystal, and this is X-ray diffraction pattern, and through mathematical computational method, you can reconstruct uh, the structure of the molecules inside the crystal. And this is a very, I think it's a 20 angstrom map of um, how the, of the nucleosome, how they pack inside, inside the crystal. And uh, crystallization was driven entirely by divalent ion. The first crystals I got were magnesium, and then uh, crystals with manganese and, and, and calcium. And actually, the smallest unit cell was obtained with manganese uh, chloride, and that's, I think, the crystallization method that has been used since then. Oh. Okay, and this is um, the, the seven angstrom resolution map, which uh, Tim is first author on this paper, um, done in 1981. And from this map, you can just about discern the DNA, which is colored in, in brown, and the globular structure of the histones, which in this case are H2A and H to B, and it's just to slice through the electron density map, so you don't see all of the structure, just the end of the DNA molecule, and you can see H to A, H to B hold the last, the ends of the DNA. And um, so in about 1980, um, we had an idea, a very low resolution idea of what the nucleosome looked like. And again, for young people, I remind you, we didn't have computer graphics. So this is a model built <clears throat> with balsa wood, painted, and the plastic tubing represents the DNA. So uh, the, the structure consists, the core is the protein, the histone octamer, and the DNA, which is uh, right-handed, the helix, DNA helix is wrapped in a left-handed sense in two negative, one and three-quarter negative supercoils around the histone octamer. And there is a fifth histone, which we are not uh, discussing today, that closes the nucleosomes. Um, and in an organization of uh, its, for what follows, it's important to understand that the <coughs> Sorry. And which came, of course, from the structure is that the H4, H3 tetramer organized the first superhel central superhelical turn, and H2, H2, B dimer um, organizes the about 35 base pair at each end of the nucleosome. <coughs> I'm sorry. So, we had an understanding of uh, the architecture. <coughs> so having the structure, obviously, then you start asking question, how is the structure used in biology? Um, you know, how does this assemble and how does it disassemble, for instance? How does it assemble in replication once DNA is replicating? How does the assemble? And the next question we turned to was, um, <coughs> sorry, I think I need some water. Thank you. Um, so we ask the simple question, what is the difference between active and inactive chromatin? So with active chromatin, we mean chromatin DNA or chromatin that has been transcribed, the DNA that contains the genes. 
Um, and we did a very simple experiment. We made RNA polymerase 2 prep, a crude prep of RNA polymerase 2, which is involved in transcribing uh, DNA into RNA. And we mixed it with nucleosome cores that have been made very quickly from growing cells, from mouse myeloma cells. And actually, as on aside, um, you know, this is 1980, 1982. We didn't know how to grow cells, but next door to me was Cesar Milstein. He was making monoclonal antibodies, and he was throwing his nuclei away. So we thought, what a great source for making active chromatin. And that's how we did. We prepared nucleosome core incredibly quickly and then mixed it together with RNA polymerase 2. And when we ran this, uh, the, 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 well, the complex on a sucrose gradient, we found two clean peaks. The 11S peak is nucleosome unbound, and then we had a small fraction, turns out about 10% of the nucleosome, in an 18S peak, which represent this complex. Then, through biochemical characterization, we first of all found that um, the nucleosome that was bound to the RNA polymerase had lost one pair of H2A dimer. We also, using a cDNA library, found that actually, essentially, all transcribed sequences were present in the, in the complex with RNA polymerase. So this was the discovery of the hexasome, which is a, a, a substructure of the nucleosome. And actually, through fruit printing, we could map where the RNA polymerase was bound. And it was very clear that one end of the DNA was more accessible than in the nucleosome. Um, and the reason I put this in is because um, and I think Tim might mention remodeling, is this recent hexasome ENO80 complex structure, which has been done by my students. So 40 years on, um, we now, knew, now know how the hexasome is using. So uh, uh, the obvious question then is, the tight packing of DNA by histone represents a significant barrier for all biological pathway whose substrate is DNA. One way to overcome this barrier is by enzyme. We have just seen RNA polymerase. Or ATP-dependent or energy-driven remodelers disrupt DNA histone contacts. There are, many, there are several different classes of remodelers. And one such remodel is ENO80. And I will show you a snapshot of cryo-EM structure of the hexasome in ENO80 complex done by Sebastian. So, um, 40 years on. Um, so what we essentially found that when polymerase uh, transcribes a chromatin template, and it's amply demonstrated more recently with being able to do genome-wide, cell-wide analysis, is that you lose one pair of H to H to be one dimer. And um, the loss of this timer, so now if we go to the ENO80 yeast um, remodeler, and in this case, the nucleosome, the spacing between two nucleosomes is very short, and by losing H2AB, you free quite a lot of DNA, about uh, 40 base pair of DNA, and then this allowed the ENO80 complex to recognize the nucleosome and actually, uh, the ENO8 is multi-protein complex. It anchors through this domain and onto the nucleosome. And the, as you will see next slide, ATPase domain actually recognizes a, a new binding site exposed by the loss of H2H to H2 B, so it can recognize H3, H4 interface. And it's the same thing, so this is, uh, it's a spacing, you, you open up, uh, you, you get um, the structure, the hexasome allows some DNA to peel off the nucleosome, and actually the ATPase domain um, 
it uh, binds here to essentially where H2B was previously bound. And this is so schematic. And the ATPS domain is here. And basically, this al allows the translocation of uh, the remodel along the H uh, H3, H4 tetramer, pumping the DNA, so translocating the histone octamer on the DNA and freeing the DNA. OK, so now I will jump m to much more recent work. I mean, it's obvious that the structure of the nucleosome open up the whole field to asking new questions, as I said. And, um, and I will tell you about a little bit about the structure of telomeres, which is, uh, cap the ends of chromosomes and protect them from DNA damage. And yet, in vivo, uh, telomeres are hotspots for DNA damage. And then they have other characteristics, like very short nucleus or repeat, re repeat length, and not in heterochromatic marks. And I, have, I will not, I said, ex except for looking for marks in the uh, Pol3 um, polymerase 2 nucleosome complex, which we, did, we only found ubiquitation. I'm not mentioning, but I hope Caroline and Tim will me mention epigenetics. Um, so is the structure of telomere chromatin different to the rest of the chromosome? And I will now, um, so I mentioned the resolution revolution using electron microscopy EM. The previous structure I showed was done by cryo EM. And essentially, there are, we have used two methods in, in, uh, to um, define uh, telomeric chromatin or, or see what telochromatin is like. One is single part cryogenic electron microscopy, cryo EM, which was Sebastian used. And then there is this method which combines light and electron microscopy called CLEM to use actually inside cells. So we can image structures directly inside cells. And uh, the cryo EM, a telomeric chromatin, which is a novel columnar structure, was done. So after leaving Cambridge after 40 years, I went to Singapore to work. And I was in Singapore for about eight years. And we set up a telomere group and also cryo EM and so on. So this work was done in collaboration with, with um, Lars Nudenhold um, and his group. And so this is reconstituted chromatin uh, on telomeric DNA. And this is a, now we are looking at actually hole in electron microscopy grid. This is a frozen sample of telomeric chromatin. And if you zoom in already by eye, you can see the nucleosome lining up, actually very reminiscent of the first stages of the crystallization of the nucleosomes. And so we see this columnar arrangement of, um, of the nucleosome. And so, um, we reconstituted chromatin. I should say we first reconstituted very long chromatin, but we saw that we, at best we saw f six, eight nucleosome stacks. So we decided then to first do a tetranucleosome and reconstitute a tetranucleosome and got a modest resolution structure, but where you see clearly this is the density, the electron density from the electron microscopy. And um, actually, um, to quickly go through, you collect data from the microscope. This is a single particle, and then you do 2D classification. And here already, you see the nice V-shaped of the nucleosome, because the DNA is very electron dense. And you might remember, we saw exactly the same thing at 20 angstrom in the uh, electron density map done by crystallography. And then we carved out the central bit of the structure. This is the stacking. We get 13 to 40 nanometers wide fibers. The nucleosome stack on top of each other. And this is actually from Tim's um, work on uh, nucleosome repeat line 157, where we see the zigzag structure. So the telomeric chromatin 
um, is different. And the first thing this structure tells you is that actually here we have continuous exposure of the DNA double helix, which might expect, uh, explain why uh, telomeres are hotspots for DNA damage, whereas in this structure the DNA is partly buried inside. Um, and then the dinucleosome uh, structure was done. Uh, the resolution of that is 3.9, and we can start seeing the role of the tail um, and the, the histone-octamer-octamer interface is very different to uh, 601 base chromatin higher order structure. <coughs> And I will not go through the detail of this, but just to say that it's a columnar structure of telomeric chromatin, which is different to the chromatin inside um, the chromosome. And we saw this close conformation, but we also noticed in our picture that not only do we have the stacked columnar structure, but we had open uh, open uh, configuration of the telomeric structure, which would then make um, the acidic patch where many uh, enzymes that repair, for instance, DNA damage repair machinery combined. And actually, this nucleosome arrangement has been seen in Archaea chromatin by Caroline Luger, and she might talk further on this. And then finally, um, it's the work of Sarah Sandin, who was my postdoc in Cambridge and then came to Singapore with me and we set up CryoEM. And it's about um, um, doing the structure of a chromatin inside cell. And for this, we use, um, sorry to go back, for this, we use correlative light and EM. Okay, one, two. And in order to see something inside the cell, to see, to know where it is, you have to put the label on it. Normally, people know confocal microscopy, you put, you add GFP to your favorite protein and you can see where it is located inside the cell or inside the nuclear. In our case, we use, uh, a de not a derivative, but it's similar to GFP, it's called the apex uh, Apex 2 because powerful two linear imaging because it's fluorescent and then you go through a chemical reaction and you deposit osmium tetroxide. It is also useful because you can use it as proximity prote proteomics. So you can both see inside the cell where something is but also you can ask what's close by to that protein. And this is not so good, but here we have new, it's clear to see, it's, it's a, a slide from a paper, unfortunately. It's, so we had transfected, so we added this tag to telomeric protein. Uh, in this case, I think it's TRF2, the human telomeric protein. And when you transfect the cells, you see fluorescence blob here, shown in green. Then you go through that chemical reaction to deposit osmium, and then this fluorescent blob, which represents the telomere, become electron dense, and it's shown as black because electrons can't go through the, the, the blob. So this is view of telomeres inside the cell. And then, of course, the beauty is in electron microscopy, we can zoom in, and, and so you could say we use the fluorescence to find where the telomeres are, and here is, and then you can do something called electron tomography where you tilt the EM stage to get three-dimensional information. And this, in this instance, we are looking at TRF1 uh, or TRF2 um, tagged um, um, telomeres. So this is a telomere. We also, to know where we are in looking at heterochromatin, we also independently labeled H2B. So we labeled TRF1, TRF2, and H2B independently. And um, again, I won't take you through the details, but you then use your uh, tilt series to reconstruct the three-dimensional structure. 
and then you can, for instance, slice through the three-dimensional structure and, and try to see where the chromatin fibers inside the telomere are. So telomere are composed of heterogeneous mesh or chromatin fibers, and if you then start measuring um, the width of this fiber, you can see uh, fibers of different, I think my, <laughs> my laser pointer is dying. Um, you can see fibers, if you look here, of anything between five, this one particularly is 11 nanometer, up to 30 nanometer fibers. And in these images, we can also see uh, uh, in the, <laughs> my pointer is dying. You have to get a new one for, for next speaker. Um, we see 11 nanometer fibers, just like we have seen in the reconstituted single particle uh, fiber. And Sarah reconstructed many, many telomeres from hundreds from different types of cells. And here is the reconstruction, 3D reconstruction of a telomere in situ inside cells. Now the resolution of this is probably only in the order. We see sometimes individual nucleosomes, so it's in the orders of 10 nanometers. So I've come to the end. And I want to thank, first of all, my students, postdoc and colleagues at the MRC, the Molecular Biology and, and Nanyang Technological University in Singapore, too many to mention uh, by name for all their contribution of over several decades. And many, I'm very glad to see that my students and postdoc have gone on in science and provided important uh, information. And finally, my granddaughter, when she was seven years old, she was asked at school to draw a scientist, what she thought a scientist looked like. And Nonna in Italian is grandma, so she, this, she drew me. I even got um, safety specs and scientist table with the glass tubes and most of all, she obviously already loves science because she put a heart and says, scientists love science. Okay, thank you very much.